I would like to invite on stage uh, Andrei Petrovsky. He will talk uh, to us about cyber forensics for the beginners. Uh, Andrei comes from a really interesting background, which he will tell us about uh, more for the what does what do we mean with cyber forensics? And uh, uh, please help me welcome him on stage, Andrei. Thank you, everybody. I hope you can hear me. As it says here somewhere, I don't know if you can read it. I work with SHARE Conference in, in Belgrade. And I'm their cyber forensicist. So many people, when I tell them what I do, ask me, and I'm, they don't really know what I do by, you know, like instinctive. And they ask me what my job is. So what I'm gonna try to do today is to explain to you what I actually do for a living. So uh, first of all, uh, this is uh, something that is relatively new, but I'd like to explain you what generally being a forensic means. The term forensic, I really don't know if you can read this, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the term forensic comes from the Latin forensis, which actually means representing something in front of the forum. As you may have known, in the ancient Roman times, the forum was the place where people gathered and all the criminal, let's say, cases were presented in front of the forum and the forum then decided which side is right or wrong. On the other hand, the, the term cyber comes from the Greek word kivernetikos, which actually means something that is quite abstract and deals with data and information. So a cyber forensic is something that deals with probably proving something in the uh, some crime that's been uh, taken place in in the cyberspace. Basically, in more modern times, the term uh, forensic has gotten another meaning, which is legal. So that means that my job is essentially to provide evidence that can stand in court in a court of law. Just. Um, a little bit of figures here. Uh, I just want to illustrate the. This is actually the number of uh, claims for uh, cyber crimes submitted uh, by by internet users, and as you can see, the number pretty much grows all the time with its peak in 2009. But uh, that's not the only thing. Why? Why cyber? The the more the more important issue here is why cyber crimes happen. And we have a situation like this. Um, this is a sweet old grandma who just got a friend, a friend request from Prince George on the internet. And she was so delighted that she's gonna accept it. And not meaning to be a sexist, I included, well, what happened here? Yeah, a guy here, he just won a prize. Imagine that, million dollars from the Nigerian prince or whoever, and he'll be glad to share his bank account. And most, most of the cyber crimes actually happen because people don't really pay attention to important things. Uh, now, what does a cyber forensic actually do? There are basically two approaches in this job. The first one is the prevention part, which is slightly, uh, which is important, but uh, it's not the most active part of the job. The, the point of this segment is to learn people how to protect themselves and to establish a system um, of prevention that doesn't really depend on them because it's really hard to educate people to leave their old habits back. So uh, the other part is the, are the forensic analysis or the interventions which happen after something after an attack has has been uh, happened, it has occurred in in some system, and uh, basically uh, these two segments are really intertwined in in a very specific way because you have uh, prevention in order to uh, prevent the attacks, but you have the interventions in order to establish a better way of prevention. So. Who can be a cyber forensic? A cyber forensic. 
uh, on this flower, let's say here, we have different characteristics which, uh, are, which show the complexity of, of, of being a good cyber forensic. These are the personal skills, and on, on the other side, you, you have the more official, like educational skills you can obtain by earning a degree in IT and then specialize in some way in cyber forensics or cyber security. When it, but I, in my opinion, the, the, this flower part is much more important because in here we can see how complex the job of a cyber forensic is. Because it's not really enough to have good technical skills, you also need to have strong social and, and uh, communication skills in order to be able to do this job. Mostly because a huge portion of the job consists on social engineering and uh, determining the behavioral patterns people use, uh, people have when they use technology in order to uh, just understand where everything went wrong. Anyway, the technical part is important as well. That's why you need a strong knowledge of firewalls, networks, software, platforms, operating systems, and pretty much everything. Prevention. So this is the uh, chief security officer in a company who makes his, his Christmas wishes, and he's not really realistic, unfortunately. He, has, he wants an antivirus that covers, that detects all viruses and all malware, but unfortunately that's not really possible, but that's why we, we need security officers who will, who will deal with these issues. Now we came to hacking, actually ethical hacking, but we, in the past couple of days we talked about what the term hacker means, that's why I'm just going to explain the difference between different types of hackers, so to speak. The first one are called suicide, suicide hackers or hacktivists. They are people who are willing to sacrifice their uh, probably commodity and, and life to some extent maybe, not, not to be so dramatic, but mostly uh, their, their professional career in order to achieve some uh, goal which is important to them. So basically they, they have a strong cause be behind their actions. The other part are the black hats or the bad hackers, also called crackers, which is probably the best term they, uh, they, can, can, they can have. And they're individuals who um, mostly do, uh, mostly try to get into some system in order to have, uh, well, mostly material gain or just, do, just be malicious for, for, the purpose, for the purpose of it. The next group is the gray hats. Are the, gray, are the gray hats who really change sites all the time. They can surf and find some site on the internet that's interesting for them to hack, and they do it. But other, uh, at other times, they, uh, they tell companies what, their flaws, what the flaws in their systems are, and they help them have better security that way. The last part are the white hackers, who are basically the ethical hackers or the cyber forensicists, who try to penetrate a system for the purpose of determining, of determining its flaws and creating strategies to, to improve the, the security of the said system. So what is common about all of these hackers is these five-step algorithm they, they, they um, uh, use to, in order to, to gain and maintain, and maintain access to, to a network. The first step is, I don't really know if you can read it, but I'm going to just go through it anyway. So, uh, the first step is reconnaissance or observation. They first, what every hacker does is observe the victim or the target. After careful, this is uh, just in order to be clear, the first two steps are mostly uh, pre-attack uh, uh, steps, the, the second two are the actual attack and the last one is clearing tracks which is what they do uh, as a last step. But uh, the first two uh, steps are really crucial because uh, without good observation of the, so to speak, victim, you cannot really uh, find the flaws of a certain system and then um, attack the, the said system. The second step 
is scanning. You, you need to scan the network. There are many software tools that allow you to do that, and uh, it's really simple. The, the most complicated part of this uh, entire story is the g gaining the actual access to, to a system. So um, once hackers gain access to a system, they need to maintain it. And these two, two, two parts consist the attack, actually. Uh, both, basically, what, they, what hackers do, what we do, so to speak, is uh, determine um, some uh, service or software that runs on a certain service, on a certain server, that is not secure enough for, uh, for to protect the system. So that, uh, that's something that uh, hackers use as a backdoor into that system. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the server as such, but rather a, s a service or a port that is uh, found at the, at the time on the server. Now, what does an ethical hacker do? As you can see here, there are four steps because an ethical hacker doesn't really need to clear his tracks after um, getting inside a system. Basically, what an ethical hacker does is ha uh, has the four steps of, of the al algorithm we had on the previous slide. And uh, the most uh, important thing with ethical hacking is to try and get into the perspective of a black hat or a cracker. Just you know, get the feeling that you want to attack a sad system and try as much as possible to use the resources that are available to you in order to get access. Now, for me, the most interesting, actually, part. part. This is uh, Sherlock Holmes. I don't know if you can recognize him. And he says, elementary, Watson. So the methodology of ethical hacking, uh, first of all, um, let's get something clear. The aim of every forensic intervention is to acquire evidence uh, in order to determine how a certain criminal act that, happen that happened in, this, in, the, in the cyberspace really happened. So the only difference between uh, classical forensic and digital forensic or cyber forensic is uh, forensics is that the evidence in this case are digital, which can be tricky because, uh, as you all know, the, the the cyberspace changes constantly, and to to determine what was going on a certain on a, at a certain point in the cyberspace at such a time at certain time it it's, it can be can can be rather difficult. So, um, we have an investigative model which is developed by the Digital Forensics um, uh, Research Workshop, which is a group of colleagues of mine that uh, get together and develop strategies for, for further development of, of, uh, these and of this one and, and similar models, is to, um, uh, bearing in mind that we work with evidence, we need to be really careful in order to provide pure evidence that will be uh, then um, uh, hard enough to, to, to stand in a court of law. So the first step is identification. And in, in this part, we need to identify what information is, is really needed. What do we need to provide? And the second, in the second step, which is the preservation step, step you, you need to make sure that the crime scene or the place where the attack happened remains unchanged for for enough uh, for a long time for uh, time long enough to for you to um, just be able to collect all the evidence, which brings us to the third step, which is collect collecting of of so evidence, which implies mostly making copies of the system at the state in which it was during the attack. Uh, explanation of uh, exploration actually of the evidence is um, something that is really important in order to determine what part of the material or the data you have found I you can use at a court of law because uh, again we're dealing with uh, legal uh, legal issues here not everything can be considered um, hard enough evidence in the an analytic phase or the phase of analysis, we are mapping the data and practically connecting the dots in the entire story in order to, to build a timeline, a timeline of, of events that brought us actually to the, uh, to the attack. 
the, the, the last part is probably the most boring part uh, of, of the entire process and it's called presentation. And it consists mostly of writing reports and that's the part of my job, of my job I hate the most because I don't really enjoy writing reports like I imagine everybody else. So uh, now, as I said in the beginning, I work for Share Defense, an NGO in Belgrade who and these are our two websites. The, the websites, the first one is of Share Defense and the other of Share Conference, which is ex actually organizing this event. I want to say this part until now was theoretical, but now what I want to say is what we at Share, um, Share Defense do by giving you two examples of our recent cases that happened in the recent couple of months. So the first case is, um, one news, one news agency in Serbia, which was attacked by hackers, by crackers actually, after publishing uh, text about one important figure in the Serbian government, about the family member of, a, of an important figure in the Serbian government. So basically what happened, uh, the, the site of this news agency uh, reported the news, and it was, uh, it went offline in, in, in a matter, it, no, it didn't actually go offline, but the content they published was off in a couple, in a matter of hours. And it, not, it wasn't a simple DDoS as most cases are, but it was, uh, which was very strange for us because we didn't really expect something like that. But only the said material was gone. So the first thing you need to do is to advise your partner or client to contact their provider and ask uh, just what's wrong, why, why did my con where did my content go? And after the, provider, after the provider saying that they have no idea what really happened, then my job starts actually. The first thing I did, as anybody would, is to try and isolate the, the server or make a, an image or a copy of the server on which the attacks happen. And what we found out, what we found out is that there was an SQL uh, injection in, in the website through a uh, poll. You know, uh, you, on some websites you have different polls where you can vote for different things. They have a question and you just vote. So the crackers basically used the set poll in order to gain access to the website. That's why I say that no, not always the, the, the server as such is, is a target, but mostly a service that runs on that server. So basically, they just um, managed to gain access to the uh, HTTP part of the, of the server and just take, take off the, the set co content. Uh, the, uh, this case is still in court and uh, as far as I know, up to date, we don't really have uh, any verdict, but I, I really hope that we'll be able to determine. And the other thing is to determine who did that? And that's probably the harder part of the job because you get uh, log files which are enormously big and you have to determine if the cracker was sloppy enough to leave a trace behind. And they usually are, unfortunately. So you need to read literally tons of pages, thousands of pages of lines with IP addresses and MAC addresses and resources uh, used on the website in order to determine who really did that. And what we found a list of uh, five IP addresses that were not uh, familiar with the agency, neither the provider nor the police. So basically out of these five IP addresses, one is the, one is the one that the cracker used in order to get into the website. The other, the other uh, case I want to speak about is the case of uh, actually cracking a personal email, uh, email account of, uh, again, a journalist in Serbia who uh, had some uh, materials about also a prominent figure in the current Serbian government. So basically what happened is that somebody cracked her email in order to um, uh, get some, some materials she had, some correspondence actually she had with some uh, of her colleagues, uh, colleagues in the UK where she was investigating something about that person in the government. And basically uh, they were bold enough to go in a TV show and just 
tell that they have the emails uh, blaming them, uh, blaming the anonymous for the attack, the group anonymous, which was not the case because it's not the it's not what the anonymous do. They don't attack journalists. They attack the government. So it doesn't really make sense. And basically what happened there is we determined that the, the email account was cracked from um, uh, Germany and England by using some VPN services. So that's another issue I want to talk about. It's really hard sometimes to determine where the attack came from, actually, because Nowadays, you have millions of different uh, anonymity tools which can be used for good as well as for bad. And they're used for bad sometimes on, uh, as well. So um, we didn't really manage to find out, but we, we, we linked the case with the people who, who were harmed the most by it. So we guessed that it's them who, who, who did it or ordered it in, in, in the final hand. But basically what's hard is to prove to the in, in a court of law that you have enough evidence to, to blame it on, on, on a certain person. And that's what probably makes this job fun and uh, not really a regular job like any other nine to five job. But that's why um, I chose this job actually because it's really dynamical. And unfortunately in Serbia, we have a lot of job to do because in a certain couple of months, uh, no, actually in July only, which is considered one of the most passive months, we had six DDoS attacks on prominent websites in Serbia, on famous websites in Serbia. And in the period of floods, we had regularly, daily, a couple of tens of DDoS attacks, which is really tragic in some way because it directly, it directly interferes with the freedom of speech. So basically, the point of this job is to build strategies for safer and, let's say, more secure websites, but unfortunately, uh, it, that's not as easy as it sounds. So anyway, there are different techniques we use, uh, like building infra infrastructure, for, infrastructure for mitigating DDO, DDoS attacks, which is open source and free, and we, 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 will often that, we will offer that to other news agencies and independent journalists, uh, investigative journalists, in order to, for them to, to protect their web portals and websites. The last thing I'm going to be really talking about today is the, we, the Global Leaks platform we will be publishing really soon. And it's again re related to the, to the flaws that happened in Serbia uh, in, in May this year. So basically, um, we um, deployed a, we, a Global Leaks platform, which we called Flood Leaks. And uh, the, the, the goal of that platform is to uh, allow people to leak materials they manage to capture during the floods, which give information about different things, and mostly about uh, things related on the behavior of the state um, in, in the time of, of floods. So basically, uh, our job is mostly to, to preserve freedom of, of speech in in, in Serbia, at least in some in some circles, but that's a really complex job. Um, and for me, as a cyber forensic in, in shared defense, it's really important to manage to educate as much people as possible to protect themselves. Even though that means that I'm going to have less uh, less things to do, but it it serves the it serves the purpose of of um, having a more democratic and, and transparent society. So if you'd like to ask me anything, I, I'll be pleased to answer. Okay, my boss gonna is going to ask me something, yeah. Okay, just to make a bit more clear, mm. Even I think it was like really great, Andre. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, we don't have just a cyber forensics guys because most of the time when something happened, when you have some kind of attack on some independent media or investigative journalists or whoever online, uh, what you what? also need to do is to, to build a legal case, not just to, to put the charge on someone, but to, in order to explain to the people 
what is legal, what is not legal. Okay, so our tactic is we have we are building some kind of uh, um, internet task force team that is like a, a um, combination of uh, lawyers, cyber forensics, and investigative journalists. Okay, so when something happened, what we are trying to do is to try to understand the legal aspect. For example, uh, I don't know, in Serbia, um, censorship is like, uh, you know, like uh, forbidden by the constitution. But basically, if you don't put this in some kind of legal way and explain this to people, no one will understand that you know, it's not okay to put something off from the internet because this is the censorship. So we are using le uh, <coughs> uh, legal experts to, to, to work on that, then providing uh, uh, cyber forensics uh, uh, services and analysis, and researching uh, uh, with some investigative journalism methods what happened. And then we are basically using all of this in, in, in form of uh, advocacy to try to change laws, to try to, to raise awareness of people, and so on. Yeah. Okay, that was not the question. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'd like to add something to this also. We're just going to complete each other. Uh, basically, what I'm happy about is that people in Serbia uh, got used to taking copies of material published online in the recent times. So, uh, in February this year, we had a similar censorship case where people didn't have the material and we couldn't publish it because nobody had it. But when the floods came, people um, had learned on their mistakes from February and captured much of the material that was posted and then taken off offline. So we, we had a, a field to, to work with. So that's great. That, that shows that we have some impact on, on, on the environment and the, that are that they are educated in some positive way that they learn something which is the ultimate goal because we can't really change the government but we can educate our people so i know that you have a bigger perspective than just than just serbia and your experience in this so how big of an issue is this more broadly say balkan wide is it particular in serbia or is it you know, quite an issue in a number of countries, and uh, is there a network of cyber forensicists yeah. <laughs> or whatever? Well, uh, actually, it is an issue in each and every of the Balkans countries because the political and social situation is quite similar. Even though it's not the same, but it's really similar. And if you see the profiles of the people that govern the Balkans countries, you, you see ma many similarities. So they, they govern the same way. So it's logical that they'll s use censorship the same way but um, if you ask me if whether there was uh, some kind of group association of actually there is there is on both uh, regional and uh, international level there is not like a national uh, association but there is there are these uh, groups w and i mentioned um, the cyber forensics research workshop which is one of the pardon, biggest associations of association of cyber forensicists and uh, yes there are practically there are associations that we i'm a member of that um deal with these issues but you know the thing is that um being uh, any hacker uh, person any type of a hacker person you it means that you don't really comply with the official uh, and standard types of uh, groups and organizations we're we are slightly different, you know. We don't really like to organize in a formal way. But the thing is, what I like most with my fellow colleagues when we talk, for instance, they're really open in, in sharing their, their knowledge, which is not really the case with other types of IT people. For example, programmers can be quite, um, let's say, uh, possessive when it comes to their knowledge, which is not the case with, with cyber forensics, which is, for me, great. Because the only way to, to learn stuff we can't really get a textbook for cyber forensics and read it. You don't learn that from a book. You, you, it's mostly experience based. So, any other questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Maybe I have one question. In terms of like, you see, you were mentioning that the government, which, 
which government is kind of the safest or kind of in the line that what, what they are doing with the cyber forensics? Well, I'll like probably... An example to take, for example, that is good. I couldn't say one government, but mostly I think that these uh, countries in the Balkans that have entered the European Union have stronger regulation in that sense, and they are not as free to do uh, what they do um, as, as the other ones. But basically, censorship is forbidden in each and every country in the Balkans uh, with the constitution. So uh, the government doesn't really do it officially, but he, uh, they have a way of doing it. I mean, uh, it's really bold of me uh, standing here and say that government, the government in Serbia censors something, but uh, it's any observant lo person with a minimum of, uh, minimum of logic, you don't have to be an astrophysicist in order to understand that. You understand that it's the government who does it. And censorship, by definition, is something conducted by the government. If something is taken off by third parties, that's not really censorship, that's mostly an attack. But censorship is when the government, in order to protect its own interests, takes something offline or just burns books or whatever. So that Thank would you. be my answer. Anyone has any more questions? Ladies and gentlemen. I just want to give some additional information, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to to add in your uh, in relation to your saying about the censorship, and yeah, I give you a total right regarding the uh, censorship enforced by government. Uh, recently, we had a lot of attacks going through in Kosovo, uh, which were directly related to uh, re uh, re uh, religious uh, problems. For example, we know that the uh, happenings regards in, uh, the Islamic groups in Syria and stuff like that. Um, all medias were attacked regarding the, the uh, news they published in their websites. And I think that this may be considered as well as a case of censorship yeah, from well. some groups of uh, whether they are eth ethnical, cultural, or uh, whatever. Yeah, by all means, it's it's detaining information as such, which is prohibited by many European and international conventions. Yeah, by all means, that's that's true. 